So we have a government that's in place. We have, you know, congressmen, senators, and we have the Department of Justice and the Department of Homeland Security and NASA, all these things. And, you know, we have some senators and congressmen that have been in, in office for 50 or 60 years. I know that's hard to believe, but it's true. Yeah, it's true. It yep. is true. The, the truth is, though, that although these entities exist, the real power brokers, the real people that make the government function, function on a, a layer inside the government but parallel to it. So, <clears throat> you know, these these ideas that, that we see where it's like, you know, you look at Marilyn Monroe, the person that made the decision to to kill her could have been part of this parallel organization within the government that saw her, whatever information she harbored as, you know, a threat. So ordered, you know, the hit somewhere inside of the government that Kennedy may never have known about or nobody that you'd ever talked to in the government knew about because it's a very small group of people that actually make the cogs turn. So interesting. <laughs> but, wow. But there there have been there have been stories that, you know, she was gonna come out and say the UFOs are real and whatever. I think the reality is is that she was <clears throat> obviously in love with him and, and they obviously had a relationship and somebody somewhere decided that that was too much of a threat. It was a destabilizing force. So they they killed her to stop that threat. That the national tragedy of having a starlet die tragically, you know, was better than her <clears throat> continuing to get drunk and, and singing songs or doing interviews or right. talking about what you shouldn't be talking about. And even now, so, I mean, she is still an icon. She's considered the, right. you know, the epitome of, of a sex goddess. You know, I mean, this is what, 50 sure. years since her death. I mean, what kind of a human being makes that kind I mean, she's more famous in death than she was in life in some way. It, you know? It's true. <laughs> and and I think, I think that in, in seeing that, you know, you see the, <clears throat> you see the outline of a, of a, manufactured mythology. It's kind of like Evita. You know, everybody, when they hear Evita, yep. they don't even know her last name. They just think, think of the song and, the, you know, the right. musical. Ma- and Madonna. Whatever. Some will go with Madonna. Yeah, Madonna. No, that's not Evita. <laughs> she played uh, Evita. <laughs> Evita. <laughs> yeah, played Evita. <laughs> but the truth is, is that, you know, that Juan Perón, um, as a as a person, her husband, and, and Avita was part of it. You know, Juan Perón did some very horrendous, nasty things. But those, but there's a kind of manufactured um, mythology about Juan Perón and Avita and what the way things were. You know, I mean, if you knew half of the stuff that Juan Perón did, you'd just fall over. <laughs> Good or bad? Bad, very bad. Oh well, my I'll God! Okay. This, I'll put it to you this way. Wow. That, <clears throat> Um, when Juan Perón was in power, right, there's a thing called the rat lines, and I'm sure you've discussed this with one of your guests at some point. This right. is a mechanism that the Ger- Germans used to smuggle out, you know, uh, I don't know how to put it, but the hierarchy of the Third Reich. The, the right. rat lines were devised by, by a guy named Otto Skorzeny, and Otto Skorzeny was a, well, they call him Hitler's favorite commando. He's the one that went in and got... Um, Mussolini out without quoting for firing a shot, right? Well, Scorzani mm-hmm. set up those rat lines. And in fact, um, in various places in Argentina, you can actually find these unmanned airfields in the mountains. These unmanned airfields where there's no air traffic control tower, there's no nothing. There are these massive runways. I mean, you can land large commercial airliners. We're not talking 737s, mm-hmm. you know, the cattle car of the sky. We're talking big planes. <laughs> Right. Like well, like mili- military uh, jumbos. Well, you could yeah, you could land a military transport for sure. But what what okay. was happening is that a lot of these Germans were coming in through the rat lines, and and Perón was fine with it. And one of the other things that he did is that there was a time in Argentina where a lot of people were disappearing, right? And what Perón was doing is he was he had a secret police like a political murder squad that would go around and, and kill people or make them disappear if they were political adversaries of his or 
he didn't like them or they smelled funny or what, whatever the reason was, he would have he would disappear them. And so there's an entire like period of time where just thousands of people vanished. Well, that secret police um, mechanism that was set up, Otto Scorzani helped Perone set that secret police up. Oh, wow. <laughs> so you have a, a hardened SS officer. Uh, I don't think I need to explain to the SS officer. You have a hardened no. SS officer setting up, <laughs> setting up, you know, the secret police for Juan Perone. This is the husband of Evita. So, you know, again, wow. Evita is very important very much a manufactured kind of mythology that she had the love affair with Argentina and she was pro-Argentina. And that very well could be true, but, you know, the Perón government was very, very dark and sinister. Wow, you know, and Hollywood makes it seem, you know, I'm going back to the musical now. You know, Hollywood portrays it as this happy, go lucky, without really looking deep behind the scenes of the politics of it all. That is very interesting, Olaf. Yeah, and, and one of the things that the people like Joseph Farrell have pointed out is that there's a lot of uh, <clears throat> there's a lot of research activity that occurred in you know in Argentina that parallels some of the things that we were doing with the paperclip scientists, and that's one of the reasons that I think that the the burn memo the the memos the two memos I talked about I was about, just going to bring that highly, up. <laughs> they're highly they're highly controversial. You know, there there's a real division on who thinks they're real and who thinks they're fake. But what I've always maintained is if they're real, you know, this is this is pretty catastrophic. Because one of the things that <clears throat> that supposedly that those those paper clip scientists did is they worked on UFOs and they worked on advanced weaponry because the Germans, you know, they had a nuclear bomb, they detonated it. In fact, if you go to the Wikipedia and you look up nuclear accidents, you will find a nuclear accident listed from Warner Heisenberg's lab in Berlin in the 40s. Really? So, I mean, they were working on Yeah, they were working on that kind of stuff. So, you know, here you've got all these paperclip scientists, and then suddenly you have JFK, you know, pushing buttons saying, well, you know, director of NASA, I want you to call the director of the CIA, I and mean, he literally ordered the director of NASA. NASA is a civilian space organization, space operation, no military capabilities, right? But it's but right. all the missions are flown for the most part. There are a few exceptions, but generally the missions were flown by military. There were a number of DOD missions that nobody will talk about, <laughs> right? And now you're talking about the... You know, you're you're talking about JFK sending a memo to the director of NASA, telling him, "Hey, I want you to talk to the head of the CIA, and declassify whatever you need to declassify by presidential order. Tell this guy what your what your defensive capabilities are." Well, you're NASA. You have no defensive capabilities. <laughs> you're not supposed to be militarized. We signed a treaty to ban the weaponization of space, even though we did it extensively. I think, I think that there's an art. Yeah, I think there's an argument to be made that he may, somewhere in the vast conspiracy of why Kennedy was assassinated, I think that those memos play a role. That either it was the his burn memo, or the burn memo. Yeah, okay. because you know you need a you need a reason, right? And I think you could have a couple of reasons. I, and personally, I've always bought into a theory of, of LBJ. So you got LBJ. He wants right. to be president, right? He's got a bunch of CIA, ex CIA, and CIA underlings that that are very angry for whatever reason. The Bay of Pigs. I mean, you've got it runs the gamble, right? Oh yeah. I so mean, he, there's all yeah. kinds of interesting things going on back back then, but in the '60s. Oh my God. Right, and and you know you've got these these. Uh, Archetypes like like E. Howard Hunt and you know and others and <clears throat> G. Gordon Liddy and all these guys who keep coming back, <laughs> right? You know you've got you've got these guys and they're they're disaffected, they're upset, they want a regime change. LBJ wants a regime change because he wants to be the regime, and people are exactly. telling LBJ he's got to get rid of this guy because he's a threat, because he's he's going places that he's not supposed to go, because. 
The problem is, the thing about the burn memo, right, the problem is, is that if Kennedy really wanted those answers and he really wanted the CIA to know and he really wanted to have these moon operations with the Russians, with the Soviets, then he's got he's going to find out about a whole lot of other things like Project Horizon, and Project Lunex, the Mole, you know, he's going to find out right. about the Almond. Mag- Majestic 12. Things. Right. Wow. Exactly. And, and, you know, just look at the at the late 50s that the, both the Army and the Air Force fronted projects to build uh, moon bases in like 1956 or 57. There's Horizon and Lunex. Horizon was the Army. Lunex was the Air Force. Horizon called for, by 1961, I think, called for having over 300 uh, astronaut soldiers on the moon in hardened facilities and defensive capabilities, right? And then you've got oh, Lunax. Wow. Lunax is, you know, the, the Air Force wanted to be flying missions to the moon. They believed they could do it by 1960 or 1961. So now, and they, this is a long time before we ever landed. So now, you know, did Kennedy know that, or was he going somewhere that he shouldn't have been going? So now you've got another reason for him to die. <laughs> There's a couple so, of I mean, reasons for him to die. Gosh. Right. Well, and people don't talk wow. about the burn memo. I'm really surprised by that. You know, it got a lot of play, and then it kind of vanished. But it's always been very controversial because, you know, people well, want to reject it, but they can't. But then they do. Well, that's the first time I've heard of it, you know, and I, I consider myself, you know, some, you know, I'm not a novice conspiracy theorist. I've done a lot of research, but that's the first time I've heard about the burn memo. So in this field, we can always learn from our colleagues and other people. Absolutely. You know, it's all, it's all about networking. And once you talked about the burn memo, I'm like, wow, now that's a new piece of knowledge I have not gotten. So I think that's very Wait. interesting. Well, I'll give you another one that's related. Let's let's assume that the burn memo is real for the sake of argument, and that the that the Soviets and us were carrying out some sort of a joint operation that Kennedy was unaware of. Right. Right. <clears throat> let's say that that we were actually doing these things, and Kennedy's about to find out. In the mid '70s, there was a magazine called Sega Saga Sega, and it was a kind of men's magazine and. They, they actually broke down the SAGA and to mean all this different stuff and, you know, whatever. But one of the things that they did is they produced a whole series of magazines in the mid-70s. And they had people like um, Brad Steiger in it and Otto Bender was in it. You know, a lot of very famous people wrote for it, right? Well, one right. of the things that they did, and I think it was Otto Bender that actually wrote this article. That's the, the guy that did the thing about the mysterious three men. Well, he did an article where he he looked at iconography on UFOs. You know, the the, the um, pictures that you see when you see a UFO, like the UMO. If you look at the photographs of the UMO from Italy in the 70s, that they had these three lines with a line through it, right? And he took all these right. things and he said, okay, I'm going to make a list of all these symbols that are seen on, on, the, on UFOs. One of the things that he discovered was that there were at least a half dozen and, and it's hard in ufology to go through and define every single instance of something, right? There's no central repository of knowledge. MUFON's got some. The National UFO Reporting Center's got some. The military's got most of them. <laughs> you know, NICAP had some. Marf, MARFON had some. They're all spread around. But he did his best, and he found six instances where UFOs actually had uh, Roman letters, meaning... English letters, and they were alphanumeric. And one of the things that he found is that there was one in particular that had a red star, right? And then it had like a, I think it had like an SD, and then a number. It was all two letters and then four digits. And there was another one, there were three, I think, that said like UN and then had four digits. And then there was another one that said US and had four digits. Right? Wow. (laughs) Now, if if I'm an alien coming from a distant star, whether it be Zeta Reticuli, Arnard Star, Alpha Centauri, whatever, 
chances are I have my own language. Okay? 